and welcome to a very special episode of the podcast bringing holiday cheer, dirt road discussions where we are all about agriculture all the time. I'm your host, Cam Hammond. The co-host of Dirt Road Discussions is a hot chocolate enthusiast and has also seen every holiday movie ever made on the Hallmark Channel, Ott Clark. Ott, it's great to be with you again. I'm kind of disappointed, though. I thought you were going to bust out that ugly Christmas sweater. I, I pondered it. Um, it's it's at home. I, I spilled some hot cocoa on it, and so uh, now now we got to wait until the next podcast, maybe. <laughs> Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, that that does. So, well, hey, that's okay. We're going to have a fun fun time regardless whether you have that sweater or not. So, uh, to all our loyal dirt roadies out there, thanks for tuning in. For those first-time listeners, we have close to 50 interesting episodes that cover fascinating stories and people from the world of agriculture. So, we invite you to check out some of the other episodes and let us know what you think at dirtroadpodcast.com. Well, Ott, as I mentioned, we have a very special show today, and one that has to do with, yes, Christmas. We love Christmas here on Dirt Road Discussions. Christmas is all about traditions and getting together with loved ones to celebrate the holiday season. So, Ott, what Christmas traditions did your family have? Uh, I've had a, a conversation with another coworker about Christmas traditions, and um, we would always wake up early, and you couldn't open any presents, but you could eat all of the candy that was in your stocking. So that was one of our, uh, our family traditions is that you could eat as much candy as you wanted, as long as you didn't open up any presents on Christmas morning. Yeah. Okay. And were you the, were you the kid that ate all the candy just right off uh, the bat? No, I, I did a some? very good job at eating all of my candy. Um, I have a, a sibling Nicely that, done. uh, had self-control, but I was not blessed with that. Uh, well, that's awesome. So one of our Christmas traditions. So every Christmas Eve, my dad would get everyone together and he would always read us Twas the Night Before Christmas. Uh, that was a lot of fun. My favorite part, though, was when he would get to where it talked about some certain characters in the book. And Santa would say, now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen. Okay, Comet, I'll Cupid, it for me. Donner and Blitzen? Oh, shoot. yes, test. you got it. Nice. Great job. So we are all about those reindeer here on the podcast today. And we're in for a treat to learn more about the magic happening at one reindeer farm. So with that, Ott, let's make it rain here on Dirt Road Discussions as we take a sleigh ride down the dirt road. So for our listeners, here is the question. So we've all heard that wonderful story. It was the night before Christmas. But what about those real life reindeer? And are there farms around that uh, house and take care of those reindeer? So, well, like Rudolph, our guest today is going to light up the podcast. We are pleased to be joined by Erica Bowie. Erica knows a thing or two about reindeer as she is the general manager of the famous Leavenworth Reindeer Farm in Leavenworth, Washington. Era, thanks for joining, or sorry, Erica, thanks for joining us here on Dirt Road Discussions. And how are you? I'm doing great. How are you guys? Lovely. <laughs> we are awesome. We are excited about reindeer today. It's not every day you get to talk to a real life reindeer farmer. So, Well, it's a pleasure to be here and um, I'm just excited for all of the mischief that these reindeer are going to get into. I don't know that we often have a computer and a, and a desk and a chair out here in their zone. And so they've been having fun with me for sure, playing reindeer games already. <laughs> I think we're going to talk about some reindeer games later. So, um, so that, yeah, we just appreciate your time. And, and like I said, we're looking forward to jumping into it. So would you mind just starting off the podcast by telling us a little bit more about yourself and your background? Absolutely. So um, I am the daughter of two Norwegians. Uh, my dad's name on the birth certificate is Hans Christian Andersen. Uh, dad <laughs> got stuck with the Danish fairy tale writer's name, uh, but he is 100% Norwegian. And so is my mother, Kari. Uh, trust me, I try to stay on my medicine for that. <laughs> Usually it works out. <laughs> yeah, sure you betcha. Um, but uh, I was raised um, in a great big Norwegian family. My grandfather is in his 80s and he still makes all of the hand rolled Norwegian potato lefse for our Norwegian bakeries in downtown Seattle, uh, a community called Ballard. 
uh, that still has a lot of Scandinavian pride and things like that. So it's a lot of fun. And um, I grew up uh, being proud of our heritage and um, grew up with a mother that adores animals and um, it kind of snowballed from uh, you know lots of kitty cats to dogs to draft horses uh, to ponies pigs chickens ducks bunnies all of it and one day mom and dad said we are going up to Alaska and we are bringing home six reindeer Oh, and uh, it was just kind of par for the course. I thought, yep, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, an amazing start to uh, the Leavenworth reindeer farm. <laughs> um, I think my first question, I've been to Leavenworth, but a lot of our listeners probably have never heard of Leavenworth. Can you describe Leavenworth to somebody? Be the, be the salesman for Leavenworth. Sure. Well, um, I think we've all probably seen pictures of uh, Bavaria and um, the beauty of the mountains and the intricacies of the building and the woodworking. Uh, when you're here in Leavenworth, it's like you're transported to Bavaria. All of our buildings are in that theme and um, not in uh, not in kind of like a, a, a chintzy way. It, they're they're absolutely beautiful. It will blow you away. Um, at Christmas time, we have millions of lights and millions of lights. And um, we love to celebrate all of our seasons here um, from fall to the beautiful changing colors to, you know, our five months of snow in the winter. Uh, we have everything from uh, white water rafting and world class hiking up in the Enchantment Mountains, just minutes from downtown Leavenworth uh, to world class ski resorts. Um, we even have a ski resort right here in town that was used to train um, Olympians, a ski jump built by Norwegians uh, many, many years ago. And um, my kids still go up for hot cocoa in the lodge and all the, all the kids get to go uh, skiing during their recesses at school. Um, it's just a magical little place to uh, be growing up and raising our kids. And we're so, so grateful to call Leavenworth our home. Man. And I brought up Hallmark earlier. Is that where a lot of the Hallmark movies are filmed or is it in Leavenworth? So it's funny that you asked that because I don't think I told your producer this. We actually had a movie filmed right here at the farm last year. Yes. And the production company um, is called, <laughs> it's called Cloudy with a Chance of Christmas. So maybe your viewers saw that it was filmed here. Um, and I just got off the phone with the Hallmark Channel last week and they are coming back out to film. So I believe that aired on Lifetime and you can see Cloudy with a Chance of Christmas on Hulu right now. Uh, but Hallmark had to get in on the action so we we hear a lot we live in a hallmark christmas movie and i guess they want to make it official <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> oh my goodness one. yes he's excited <laughs> we might need Ott to come be an extra in the movie oh my man. wife's brain Ott. would explode if she saw me in a hallmark movie <laughs> i i'm all for it uh i'll be there you, you let me know great. the date and time okay, great deal. you're invited <laughs> okay <laughs> we don't we don't really like to be in front of the camera. So whenever people come to film, we always just get people that work on the farm or our neighbors that like to be in front of the camera. And so uh, you are absolutely welcome to come uh, be in front of the camera. I've, so I don't have I've that. heard uh, <laughs> that uh, I have a voice for radio, but a face not, you know, uh, not for television. So um, I might be a, I might be a background character as well. Um, all right, let's let's get Perfect. to reindeers. That's that's what I want to learn about today. Um, you said you brought down six okay. from Alaska, correct? Yeah. So um, in August of 2016, my mom and dad went up to Palmer, Alaska, which um, I want to shout out Denise Hardy and her family, largest reindeer farm in the United States, incredible family, family run business, just like we are. She took over for her father. Um, uh, just a few years before we started our farm and she has been instrumental in the success of our farm. Uh, she's one of those uh, people that just teaches you with an open hand and an open heart, never uh, mm -hmm. wanting to keep things for themselves, but just she's she's just she's an amazing person so i want to give denise a shout out she's actually president of reindeer farmers of america a group that we're really proud to be a part of and um 
it just helps reindeer farmers all over the country. Um, and so we give her a big shout out um, because we wouldn't have Leavenworth Reindeer Farm without her and her willingness to um, get us started in this when we knew next to nothing. So my parents started going up to Alaska and they volunteered on the farm up there. They took part in the uh, annual running of the reindeer, which commemorate, commemorates the start of the Iditarod race and uh, just kind of got some practice with reindeer handling. And they brought our first six reindeer down on a boat. Uh, we called all the airlines. They said, get this, they would never fly reindeer. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, man. we obviously a little bit ironic, but we found a boat ride. It was seven days out of beautiful Whittier, Alaska. You cannot bring reindeer through Canada. Uh, they fall under a different classification there. So here in the United States, the reindeer are classified under the USDA, whereas in Canada, they are fish and game. And so uh, just with the permitting and things like that, there was going to be um, a little bit more red tape. So we went on a boat and we fell in love with that first herd of six reindeer. They're all alive wow. and well today. Um, and so we basically started dreaming right away of having a larger herd. We knew we were in it with our whole heart. And so mom started writing letters to the heads of all the airlines. And one day a letter actually came back in the mail from Alaska Airlines and they said they would love to prove reindeer really do oh, fly. Oh, yes. <laughs> and so uh, we put our first three reindeer on Alaska Airlines. Uh, they were all confirmed pregnant by WSU. And that is how we had our first three babies born on the farm in 2017. Holy cow. What a great start. This is, this is fun. Yeah. yeah <laughs> this is, wow. So for our listeners, um, if you're just, just listening to us, Erica has got some reindeer just wandering behind her right now on the video, and it is just fun to see. So, um, Erica, so you mentioned that your family loved animals, but I'm I'm sure that mm -hmm. there was a little bit more than just your mom waking up one day and saying, "Hey, let's get some reindeer." How how did yeah. that all start? So uh, she joined. Reindeer Owners and Breeders of America um, before we ever owned reindeer. And she started attending conferences and we didn't know if reindeer would do good here. You know, you think of reindeer being in really cold places. We um, we didn't want to bring them here if, if this climate wouldn't be good for them. We have, you know, nice, we have all four seasons here. We do have a lot of, a lot of snow, um, uh, but we wanted to make sure that, that a, that we would be good caretakers of them and B, that they would be in a place that would be good for them. And so we got in touch with Dr. Greg Finstead. He was head of the reindeer research program up at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. And uh, he basically noted that Leavenworth is at the same latitude on earth as the parts of Mongolia that have the healthiest, largest reindeer herds on planet earth. And we said, wow, what does that mean? Well, it turns out we follow the same weather patterns and we grow all the right foliage right here in our backyard to keep this herd's diet as natural as possible, which is a huge part of why this herd has been so healthy. Erica, I'm, I'm looking at the video and I would encourage you guys, uh, I think that uh, the, the podcast is, is going out to YouTube as well. So if you want to look at some reindeers in the background, you okay. can uh, go find us on our YouTube. Uh, we'll have a link in the description or something. I, that's above my pay grade. Um, I've seen more than six reindeer just wandering around in the background. How many reindeer do you guys have these days? I'm nervous I'm going to get an antler to the back because we don't normally sit down in the pen. So we started with six reindeer and we now have 32 reindeer. Man. Hello. <laughs> They're very yeah. interested in my chair. Yeah. So the, the first three babies that I mentioned that were born on the farm, um, they were so cute. We love baby reindeer and we've been fortunate to have uh, very healthy babies born on the farm. But one of those babies, we always tell the story, he made a very special entrance into the world. He was actually born during one of our farm tours. So he was surrounded by a group of people. I'm pretty sure they got a little more than they bargained for that day. <laughs> Uh, and we thought, you know, we should let this crowd of people name him. And they unanimously chose the name Sven. Sven. So uh, that is how he was the first bull calf born on the farm. And uh, Sven is absolutely massive. 
Uh, we've got some big reindeer walking by, but Sven hasn't hasn't walked by yet, but he's very big. By the time Sven had turned three years old, he was so big, we no longer had a scale big enough to weigh him. Oh, man. And just a second. I got to get this. Little... <laughs> I got all these little, little reindeer so interested in my chair. So we ended up calling our friends over at the big zoo in Seattle, and they were super kind to drive over the mountains with a massive self-leveling scale it came in on the back of this big truck. And we did get our whole herd weighed that day. We uh, saved the best for last, and it took several, you know, big farm hands, and we got Sven up onto the scale, and he broke oh, it. Oh, man. So he's a very big boy, and we joke that Sven um, and now the sons of Sven uh, might have just like a little more caribou in them than the rest of the herd. I have to stand up because uh, they're just too interested in me. Hi, honey. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So what's what's that? So when when a person <laughs> first gets to the farm and they walk up to a reindeer, I mean, they look like they're very friendly, very docile, but. What, what are they, what's their reaction? What's it like walking up to a reindeer the first time? I think we see, um, we've seen every reaction. Um, we see people crying of happiness. We see people crying that they're scared. Um, uh, we see um, mostly it's just a very uh, magical experience for uh, anybody from, you know, two to 92. Um, because it's not often that you get to get this up close with um, an animal like this that you don't see, um, you know, at a petting zoo or at the state fair. And there's a reason for that, by the way, we can get into that later. Um, but we give all of our guests a, uh, a cup of food and then spring through fall, they also get a willow branch. And so everybody's going in here with food to feed the reindeer. And so you can feed them right out of the palm of your hand. You can feel their fur covered noses. Um, it's a lot of fun. I, I'd say that it's the best job in the entire world, I, but I'm pretty I, biased. I can't disagree with you there. I very envious <laughs> right now. So the, one of the things I've noticed is, uh, everybody has antlers. Um, and are they called antlers? Is that yes. the right term? They are, they are called antlers. We, um, we hear a lot of people call them horns. So the word reindeer comes from the old Norse word reinen, which means horned animal. Uh, but uh, as you pointed out, these are not horns. A horn is hollow. It stays on the animal for the life of the animal. Uh, we joke you could fill up your favorite beverage in a horn like the Vikings did. But the antler here, it is solid bone. It sheds once a year. It grows back bigger the next year. Um, and reindeer are, as you pointed out, the only species of deer where both the males and the females grow mm -hmm. antlers. And the, the antlers, they grow really fast, right? Is that true? They do. So if um, your listeners are familiar with moose, uh, they would know that they start growing their antler at around two years old. Reindeer are all born with two little black dots on their head. And at four weeks old, the first antler nubbin pops up just at a month old. And then two months later, they're wearing their first set of adorable baby reindeer antlers. And uh, we typically see uh, see if this little baby can you see that baby we typically see about a 6 to 18 inch spike that first few months of life they'll wear them through the winter shed them and then grow their first big kid antlers and um, they're quite impressive at just one years old and then each year they get bigger so um, the, the bulls by the way they will typically shed their antlers by Christmas time uh, ladies listening that's why we we're pretty positive it's the girls flying Santa's sleigh. <laughs> um, the last ones left in hard antler at Christmas time are usually the females. And that is because by that time, um, if they're carrying a baby, most of their nutrition is now going toward growing a baby. It slows down the new antler growth, um, causing them to hold on to the last year's antlers beyond everybody else in the herd. And this is a really neat way that the females that are expecting, so we'll expect babies second week of April. Um, all those expectant mothers will hold on to their antlers until then, and they will firmly rule the herd because they'll be the last ones left in hard antler. And that's how they protect wow. their little ones. Is there a market for antlers? Yeah. What do you guys do with them? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There is um, our first year of getting antlers. Uh, we just kind of 
We had a very tiny gift shop, which we joke about because it was basically a folding table and a stuffed animal and a mug. Uh, and uh, if you, if anybody's been to the farm, you know that it's much more than that now. I think we're up to 2,000 square foot gift shop, um, the, the largest reindeer gift shop in the world. Um, but we, we put out antlers just thinking, oh, you know, maybe somebody would buy them. And every time we would put out an antler, it was sold that day. So we quit doing that. We quickly kind of put our heads together and figured there's such a demand. Maybe this could be a fun way to raise money uh, for a good cause. So each year we pick a charity. Uh, we've done the Make-A-Wish program. We've done our local food bank. This year we've partnered with the Caribou Conservation Alliance, which is an amazing organization we're so proud to be a part of. Uh, but we do uh, raffle tickets. And so people can go online to leavenworthreindeer.com or experiencereindeer.com, buy a $5 raffle ticket, proceeds going to caribou conservation efforts. And uh, we will, uh, you can buy as many as you want, but the gal that won last year, she won uh, a massive set of bull antlers off of just one $5 ticket. So she got lucky. Um, and it's just, it's a really fun way to send someone home with a set of antlers. We'll make an announcement on, I believe it's December 15th, the winner, and we will ship them wow. anywhere in the world. Our hope is just to get those antlers to somebody by Christmas time. Man. So reindeer, it sounds like, are just fun, magical creatures. So besides bringing joy and presents and happiness to children all over the world at Christmas time, what else... What, what are some of the other uses for reindeer? I mean, I, I did read that reindeer's um, milk yeah. is really high in milk fat. I mean, can you utilize reindeer it milk? Is. or so, so we we do, but we do that for a different reason. So um, basically, I'm going to see if I can sit down again. It's so funny being out here with them doing this. I love it. I hope I hope your listeners are able to get on YouTube <laughs> and watch this. Um, but... <laughs> But reindeer milk, it is actually 22% milk fat. So if you're drinking whole milk, you're getting 4 to 5% milk fat. Um, the only higher milk fat in the world is the milk fat of wow. a seal. So it's the second highest in the world, second only to a seal. It is a lot more of the consistency of like if you made pancake batter. Um, and I know because... I've milked our reindeer. And the reason that we milk them is different than like in the children in Mongolia actually milk their reindeer and immediately put it on a frying pan and they make pancakes oh, out of it. Man, that's wild. It's very nutritious. Uh, we actually milk our reindeer, not all of them, but a few that we know just are those moms that have an overflow of really good milk. Um, once their baby has gotten enough colostrum and, you know, baby's happily sleeping milk drunk, we will go in and milk, like, for example, Frey is one of our reindeer that always has extra milk and we save her colostrum in case of an emergency which twice on the farm we've had to bottle raise um, we believe in mom raised reindeer uh, but we will intervene to save a life and so this year little midnight was born and her mother walked away from her and we had 13 ounces of fresh reindeer colostrum ready to go and that is mm. what saved her life so um, other uses for reindeer, uh, well, 80% of the reindeer herds in the world are actually raised for meat. Um, and so that is why they fall. So they're a protected species here in the lower 48, but up in Alaska, they're raised for meat all through Norway, Sweden, Finland, Latvia, um, Mongolia, Russia, all of those countries. If you think about their growing season for hay, it's extremely short. Um, it makes raising cattle very expensive. When we were um, in Norway in March visiting our family and everywhere you go, it's reindeer sausage on the menu. It's just as normal as getting a hot dog at Costco or speaking of Costco, the Costco in Alaska serves reindeer sausage. I have a friend here that's just really interested in my computer. <laughs> um, and so uh, we actually, we have a, uh, a little mini restaurant on uh, the farm that opened last year called Blitz and Brew. And we serve reindeer sausage wrapped in hand-rolled Norwegian potato lefse. Uh, we import that from Alaska, from Alaska sausage and seafood. And it's just really a neat way to share um, that culture with all of our guests um, that many of them have not had a chance to taste that. Reindeer is the meat 
is extremely lean. It doesn't taste gamey. It's actually just as healthy as eating fish. And um, it's delicious. We also sell jerky that's mixed with Wagyu beef. Um, and we get that from Finland. So, um, so yeah, I'd say other uses for reindeer are meat um, because the people, especially like the Sami people that live up in Northern Norway, Sweden, Finland, I mean, they're living in some of the harshest environments on planet Earth. They've survived for centuries by, you know, you eat, sleep, and breathe reindeer. You use every part of this animal for your survival. And um, it's really a beautiful culture and one that we um, love to educate our guests about. How about the fur? Uh, are they extra soft because of the, yeah. the cold climates they live in? They are. This hair right here is actually growing in at up to seven to 10,000 hair follicle per square inch. In the next 30 days, most of this herd will be completely snow white. Um, the hair is the same as a polar bear, by the way. Um, so it is hollow encapsulated. This works for insulation. This works for flotation. Um, herds in the wild, some reindeer herds actually will migrate further than any other terrestrial land mammal on planet earth. Um, they can travel two to 3000 miles every year between breeding and feeding grounds. So that means they're constantly through big rivers, lakes, streams. In fact, um, we love sharing this because reindeer were actually clocked swimming in open water at 6.2 miles wow. per hour, which is faster than Olympic Jeez. gold medalist, Michael Phelps. Huh. So, we joke if reindeer got in the pool with Michael, Michael would come out with the silver medal. Uh, reindeer taking home the gold. And that's, that is because of that, that hair that's hollow, um, gives them very good flotation in the water. Um, they've been seen swimming up to 20 miles between islands in northern Norway through open water, right through um, the shipping lanes. Um, it's, it's incredible, uh, their will to survive when they're on the hunt for food. The only thing more magical than seeing a reindeer flying, you know, landing on your roof would be see one uh, <laughs> swimming 20 miles away from an, an island. That's, that's wild. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they'll they'll eat all of the lichen moss on one island and move on to the ne on to the next. So, I, I want to ask you about lichen too here in a minute. But um, so they're yeah. they can travel a long ways, and I'm sure through some very tough, harsh conditions, not a lot of food. There's something unique about them with snow. Can you tell us more about that? There is. So for as farmers with draft horses, this was really a hard one to wrap our minds around. So when winter comes and we have fresh snow, of course, if you own horses or cattle, you are constantly around the clock in the winter, making sure their water doesn't freeze and going out in the morning and breaking up those waterers. And, you know, the heated waterers just feel like they're constantly breaking. I mean, we, we get into very cold temperatures. I, we had a couple of weeks this last uh, winter where it didn't go above four degrees. So um, it was hard for us to wrap our minds around the fact that our reindeer do not need water when there's fresh snow on the ground. And so the first year we would tromps out and be breaking up their waterers and making sure they had clean water to drink every day and nobody was touching it. And we, it's almost one of those things where you had to see it to believe it, that reindeer are designed to eat snow as their source of wow. hydration. It's incredible. Is, are they the only, is that unique to them? No other mammals have, can do that or? You know, I've never actually been asked that question. And now I don't know if somebody can hop on Google. I think we need to figure that out. That's a really good question. Um, they, they are the only mammal on earth that can see in ultraviolet. So they have incredible eyesight. Um, they can see lichen moss on the ground. They can see urine in the dark. So they track predators that way. They have the same wow. eyesight as a butterfly. So when you're coming to see our reindeer, um, most of the time kind of depends on what part of the world you're in, but our reindeer usually have, it looks like they have brown eyes. Uh, but what you're actually seeing is a protective covering that works kind of like a built-in set of polarized sunglasses. This protects them in the event of snow blindness. 
Um, and their true eye color is actually a glowing blue. So it was, it was the University of London that discovered this about, I believe, five years ago. They published a study on reindeer eyes and um, they figured out, oh my goodness, this animal can see in ultraviolet. They see Golly. the full spectrum uh, that, of color. That makes sense now. That's how they can spot that rooftop from 30,000 feet and just drop right on there, right? Oh, yeah. I, I'm spray Absolutely. Painting. It makes I'm sense. I'm spray painting twice. my roof to like with ultraviolet paint to make sure that Santa knows that my house is the right one. Yeah, exactly. so he won't miss he hasn't you. Never missed you. He's never Good missed idea. me before, but just want to make sure. Except for those times, let's to drop off some coal, right? Yeah. So yeah, it happens. Uh, it you happens. gotta heat the you gotta heat the house uh -oh. somehow. <laughs> okay, I want to jump into Christmas. Um, Christmas reindeer. Okay, they, they walk hand in hand. Um, Tell me, I don't know, tell me a story about Christmas in Leavenworth. Ah, Christmas in Leavenworth. I mean, a million stories come to my mind. It, I, that season for us just kind of, in a way, it never ends. And in a way, it gets over like a flash. It seems like we always have our Christmas countdown posted in the barn and people are like, oh my goodness, you know, 89 days till Christmas. And we're just always doing that countdown in our minds. Here on our farm, um, we will see up to 1500 visitors a day. Oh, and um, so it's kind of a blur <laughs> that time of year, but it's also the most magical time on the farm because um, obviously it's so fun to come see reindeer year round. Um, but in the in the winter time, you have that um, little childlike faith that comes in of the of the little ones that come in, um, and they believe they believe in Santa, they believe in the magic of reindeer, and so uh, we try to have a lot of fun with that. We we're definitely um, a spot where you're going to learn and be educated on all of the fascinating things about reindeer, but we also have have a lot of fun with um, that belief in this animal maybe uh being a little bit more than they seem man now i bet you make christmas dreams and wishes come for or come true for everyone that walks onto your farm and that that's pretty cool so so you said i can't remember the number but that seems like a lot of visitors in a day total how many visitors walk onto the farm throughout the course of the year so we're expecting around one hundred and fifty thousand by the end of the year and that sounds like a lot. And to people listening, they're like, oh my goodness, that's how in the world would, would you handle that? It, it snowballed. <laughs> it didn't start that way. The first year, the first year we opened was, was really an accident. So we got our USDA license and um, it's the same license that the big zoos have. It basically allows you to exhibit your reindeer both on and off the farm. And since um, we had that, it was Christmas time and we decided we'd put out a little folding sign, come meet the reindeer reindeer. We didn't have a website. We didn't have ticketing. We didn't have anything except for my dad standing around a campfire and six reindeer. <laughs> we had 300 people down the driveway that day because uh, Leavenworth's a busy place in Christmas. And at the end of the night, I remember our family just sitting down on a couch, exhausted, like what just happened? That was, there was something to that. People really enjoyed being here. And maybe this is something we could do again next year, but maybe be a bit more organized. And so um, we uh, started doing online booking and it was really important to, uh, to us to not have people feel like, you know that feeling, we love Disneyland, but that feeling where you're just stuck in this big crowd and you just feel like, uh, I don't know, like there's just too many people and man, I, if we could just have a little less people. So we limit our group sizes and we've done that since, you know, even before the pandemic, um, and that's really nice. So, so our groups are made up of 50 people and we have, like I said, we have 32 reindeer. So everybody has a lot of reindeer all around them. Uh, we start out with an educational presentation. 
Um, and that is, you know, happens around campfires in the winter. And of course, people are drinking hot cocoa and hot cider and um, eating mini donuts and things like that. And then they come inside the enclosure and we spend about 20, 25 minutes in the enclosure, feeding them, taking photos, asking more questions. And then of course, Santa Claus makes a stop oh, yeah. by. He's here all of November <laughs> and December. So people typically spend about an hour, maybe an hour and a half total on the farm by the time they've, you know, gotten to eat some Scandinavian food and picked out some fun souvenirs in the gift shop. Um, and so it's a, it's a lot more organized uh, than it was back in those early days. Um, but it, it's just been, it's been a lot of fun to watch that progression. I don't think in our wildest dreams, we ever thought we'd all be doing this as a full-time job. My father at the time uh, was a deputy sheriff um, and my mom um, owned two dementia specialty adult family homes. So she's caring for elderly. She has a big heart. She also cares for animals. And this was just kind of a natural um, progression for us, I guess. So all of us have since quit our day jobs and we do reindeer wow. farming full time. Okay, I have I have more questions about uh, Christmas. So, at, at my family, sure. we have a plate of cookies for Santa, and we leave a bunch of carrots carrots out for oh, the yes. reindeer. Uh oh, um, I, that's oh, no. why I'm asking. Oh no. oh no! What should I be feeding? What you mentioned willows? Um, is that the favorite treat? Yeah. Well, okay. Unless you have a greenhouse, you're probably not going to be able to okay. feed them willow at Christmas time. I'm lifting my computer because I have another little visitor over here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so reindeer do not eat carrots. Oh, I know I'm going to blow everybody's minds here, but you know those yeah. that big smile Sven had in the movies? Those are Disney teeth. So reindeer actually can't bite through carrots. They have a hard upper palate and they have itty bitty teeth on the bottom. And so they need soft foods. They prefer leaves like willow, birch, aspen, cottonwood, fireweed, dandelions. They actually love magic mushrooms. And I think oh. that definitely helps with the flying okay. part. Um, and then in the winter time, uh, the best treat you could leave for the reindeer and Santa would be lichen moss. Uh, that is their favorite food in the winter. You you just can't give them enough moss. So we bring our herd. Uh, I should pan the camera over here for those that are watching. Do you see this big pile here? We bring in two to three fresh trees every day and they are covered in lichen moss. So the herd has a chance to forage like they would in the wild. And then we bring in a truckload in the morning and a truckload in the evening of all of their favorite leaves um, spring through fall. Wow. So oh, okay. I, I would say no carrots, uh, but definitely grab some lichen moss and or some magic mushrooms and they'll be very happy. Okay. Magic there mushrooms probably help with the seeing all the spectrum of the. Uh, the <laughs> yes, that combined with the ultraviolet yeah. vision, I'm sure it's very exciting yeah. to be a reindeer. <laughs> Jeez, sign me up. Huh? Um, so. <laughs> Lichen moss, Erica, is that just regular tree moss? Yeah, there's different varieties. Okay. Like Just like with our willow, we actually grow 400 different varieties of willow right here in Washington State. There's several different types of moss. Um, we It's so neat to use modern technology. So we have a plant finder app on our iPhones. And anytime we're out foraging, you just take a picture of it. Sometimes we're in areas where we don't have service. So you take a picture and then bring it back to service. But um, I've found I've found over 50 varieties of moss um, that we feed, and some of them okay. they don't like as much, and some of them the second that you put it in your hand, it's gone. Hmm. So um, we've kind of gotten to know their favorites. Okay, good, good to know. Um, so many things, so many ahead, things uh, that I never. It's knew. really. It's really, it's really funny because the, the lichen moss that, that is their favorite, it kind of looks like Santa's beard. It's very light in color. And I think one of the names for it is old man's beard. So we just joke like, oh. well, of course they like that one the best. It reminds them of Santa. Of well, Santa. Yeah. Okay, Erica. Um, I want to jump into a yeah. quick lightning round. We love the lightning round here on Dirt Road Discussions. We're going to ask you some quick, brief questions. Hopefully Perfect. Uh, we won't do anything too crazy here, but um, 
and then maybe we can jump back into Christmas towards the end. So, okay, Erica, okay. first question, favorite Christmas movie? Ooh, Die uh, Hard. No. Well, no. <laughs> Oh, that was uh, a joke. That was a joke. I knew that would gross. upset you, Ott. Uh, Rudolph the Red, <laughs> Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer is my favorite Christmas That's good. movie. That's good. Course. Favorite yes. reindeer on your property? Yeti. Yeti. Tell me about Yeti, real quick. Yeti was born this year. He was nine pounds at birth and he was pure white, which our babies are normally born like chocolate brown. So he, I don't know, we just love his personality. His mother um, came from Alaska and was a little bit shy and kind of her personality was more shy. And baby Yeti is the friendliest baby we've ever had born on the farm. So we've just been getting a kick out of like a very shy mother having the most extroverted baby who wants to go up and say hi to everybody. Um, anyways, we just love his personality. We fell in Sorry, love with Cameron, him. Sorry, really Cameron, I'm ruining huh. lightning round by asking extra questions. <laughs> that, that's okay. Sorry. That's okay. Um, Yeti. Yeti. I'll keep it short now. Just Yeti. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, uh, I just lost my train of thought. Different breeds of reindeer. <laughs> Are there lots of different yes. breeds of reindeer? Yes. Okay. Okay. There are. And our reindeer are, so reindeer and caribou are the same species. I'll try to say this quickly since it's the lightning round. <laughs> same right. species, different subspecies. Our subspecies of reindeer is called the Gronti subspecies. You'll usually find those in Alaska and Yukon Territory. Okay. But there are hundreds of species of reindeer. Mm -hmm. Maybe thousands. No, hundreds. Uh, favorite Christmas tradition? Candlelight service on Christmas Eve. I love that tradition. We've been doing it since I was a little girl. I love when they pass around the candles and they turn all the lights off in the church. And it's just the most holy moment to sing Silent Night. And just, um, I don't know, I've just always loved that tradition. Wow. Um, do reindeer actually play games? Or what, Absolutely. what games do they play? Uh, <laughs> They love the game where, so they'll work all of the lichen moss off of the tree. And then this time of year, they use their antlers to thrash their antlers through the tree, you know, removing the velvet and just getting them shined up. So once a tree is laying out bare, they actually use it as like an Olympic jump. And the babies usually start it every night. We have like magic hour where the babies start jumping over you know a stick and they go around and around in circles trying to do the very best jump and it is so amazing and one day we have this great big um, fallen tree that's out here we try to keep their environment out here very natural and so we have this great big fallen tree it's a uh, maybe two feet tall and reindeer are not known to be jumpers they're incredibly fast but they don't jump as high as like white tail black-tailed mule deer uh, their hind ends just aren't built for that but they got going around so fast one night that Olaf who's another favorite reindeer jumped over that massive <laughs> jumped over that massive log and I swear all of the reindeer if they could have applauded they would have he won the reindeer games that night <laughs> I'll never still forget talked it. about yes. to this day in reindeers yeah mm -hmm. oh yes it was amazing uh, I'll, I'll go again um Christmas Treat. Yeah, Christmas your favorite Christmas treat. treat. Uh I have to say it's lefsa. If you guys don't know what that is, it's basically, it looks like a tortilla, but it's made out of potato. And the traditional way to eat it is with butter, cinnamon, and sugar, and it's rolled up like a churro. So Ooh. if any Norwegians are listening, you guys definitely know about lefsa. It's a tradition to make it with grandparents in your home, um, especially around the holidays. And nothing makes me feel more like the holidays than my grandpa making his lefsa. Ah. Do you guys serve that at the farm? We do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. And this is an obvious question. So you've got your dad, Hans, you've got Sven, you've got yep. another reindeer named Olaf. I mean, is that just the most awesome thing ever? 
<laughs> people actually think that oh you named your reindeer after the characters in that very popular disney movie but we have these names in our family i mean i'm wearing my great grandmother's wedding ring right now and this was purchased for her by my great grandfather named olaf oh, so man. um these names are just our family names um it's uh, we are absolutely forever grateful to walt disney uh for making the frozen movies and just um how much mm -hmm. people have fallen in love with those characters and it's just been another way that we have an open door to uh, share our culture with the world. And then we love to have all the other cultures come visit our farm. And um, we, we love to travel our family and we love to meet people from all over the world. Um, and it's just really neat to get into those conversations with our visitors of where are you from? What are your traditions? And to find out that um, there's actually a lot of similarities. It doesn't matter where you're from in the world. So many of us have things that are more similar than than not and so i find that really cool i think that uh making snacks with your grandparents is probably universal <laughs> yep. worldwide mm -hmm. right yeah worldwide yeah. and erica if i could just give one suggestion for a future baby reindeer name so okay oh no we how about camelot okay. how does that sound <laughs> Camelot. Camelot. I, I, I'm wondering now if you have a full name, Camelot, or is it Cameron? It's it's well, the mix just of both Cam of and, us. It's our Cam hybrid. and Ott together. Yeah. Camelot. It's Cam yeah. and Ott. Okay, now I'm picking up on it. All right, we'll see what kind of performance Ott can Ooh. give in this upcoming Hallmark movie. I might Hallmark dump you, movie. Cameron. I might be like, hey, this this little guy is named after me and me only. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh. We have a lot of fun picking their names. Um, we have a reindeer that was born under a green shooting star. We named him Comet. Mm. We have a reindeer that was born under a full moon. We named him Moonshine. Um, it's it's just really fun to to choose their names. I mean, we really get into it. We've gotten into a lot of very heated family arguments over what um, you know, a particular reindeer should be named. And sometimes a baby's born and you just know it, like with little mm -hmm. Yeti. He just looked like a little Yeti. Sense. It fit him well. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, lightning round. Should we, should we wrap it up, the lightning round? I, I have a question, and this came up prior to, you know, prior to recording, and it's going to take longer than, than the lightning portion. Um, you okay. mentioned the um, giving the the bulls, I guess, um, uh, a hormone to make it so that they wouldn't, well, you explain it. You know what I'm talking about. Sure. So before we started recording, of course, you just fired off a bunch of questions, which I love because you're interested in reindeer. So we get this question a lot. I apologize. The Polar Express is actually going by me right now. Our train is oh, coming man. through. It just keeps getting um, better. So I apologize if you hear that in the audio. We have um, 10 intact bulls in our herd. Uh, bulls typically in the wild will live three to five years. At the onset of rut, which is our breeding season, uh, it starts in September, it can go through November. Uh, at the onset of rut, their heart muscle will more than double in size. So from the time a bull strips the velvet off of their antlers, we typically have about seven days before that testosterone level has spiked. Uh, in this time, after they shed velvet, we administer a female hormone called Depo. Uh, it is a testosterone blocker that lessens the onset of rut. And what it does is it saves their heart muscle, um, which can actually more than double their life expectancy. So we expect Sven and his buddies here on the farm to live seven to 10 years versus that three to five um, it also just makes this time of year a lot easier on them. When a bull goes into rut, um, of course, they're only thinking about one thing. They can lose up to a third of their body weight. Um, it's just kind of a miserable time and, and it's dangerous. It's something where you um, can have fences destroyed. Um, people don't go in with our breeding bull. We use a bull one time in their life for breeding. Uh, this year it was Ilo. We set up the honeymoon suite. He was back there with six of his sister wives. 
Uh, we put up panels to where uh, the, it's privacy screened so that he can't see out. Um, you know, you learn lessons over the years where if our bull and rut is able to see out and he sees a girl that he would like, uh, they'll basically stop at nothing to get to that female if she's in heat. So, you know, you kind of learn your lessons, but uh, Depo has worked wonderfully for us. We we have not castrated any of our bulls um, because they uh, tend to have problems growing healthy antlers, and uh, we uh, so so we've we've administered this hormone and it, it works really well. And it it turns our bulls um, they still have enough testosterone to be interested in the girls. They just can't breed, and they're safe for us to be around and for our guests. There you go, Cameron. Interesting. Who yeah. knew? Interesting. <laughs> so Erica, um, just this whole, the whole evolution of, of your family's farm and where it started and, and where it is now, I'm sure it's been quite the journey. What's been, what's been your biggest lesson learned? What have you enjoyed most? I enjoy being able to work with my family. I enjoy being able to work outside. I think there's always those days as farmers where you can complain about getting up when it's still dark outside, putting on a thousand layers of clothes because you're cold. And then you always get to that moment where you start working and you're warming up and you're shedding your layers and you look around and you really think, I am so blessed. I am so blessed to be able to be outside working on a farm. I don't think there's any happier people in the entire world than those of us that are lucky enough to be able to get outside and work with our hands every day to care for animals. It has been, I don't know, it's been the biggest blessing. And I say this because I came from a job working in a great big um, high rise downtown Seattle as an executive assistant. So this is as far from what I'd ever picture my life ending up as. Um, I never thought I could leave the city and now I would never go back, not if you paid me a million dollars a year. I would, this is, um, the best part is being able to work with my mom, my dad, my brothers and sisters and being able to work outside every day. That's amazing. Well said. On the Dirt Road Discussion Podcast, we like to look down the road. What do you see as the future of the, the yeah. Leavenworth Reindeer Farm? Well, we have a lot of big dreams here at the farm. Uh, one of them is actually about to finally start to come to fruition. A couple of years ago, we had a dream. Uh, what if we could bring the Northern Lights right here to Leavenworth? Uh, because we brought reindeer, so would that be possible? So we started looking into it and we are building one of the world's largest geodesic projection domes. We are gonna bring the Northern Lights right here. Maybe you can picture like a massive igloo. Um, all of our guests are gonna be able to go inside, view the Northern Lights, and then uh, they will be watching reindeer herds from all around the world in 360 projection with beautiful music, with special effects. And um, we just thought if uh, we wanted, we wanted this farm experience to be something that could be lasting beyond us, that we could pass down throughout our family and through the generations. And as the farm's gotten busier and busier, um, uh, my dad started with presentations. Now I've taken over for him and we kind of share, but uh, a person can only give so many speeches in one day before you can't even talk anymore. But rather than just putting it onto a regular 2D screen, we wanted to kind of level up and give um, give our visitors something that they could really, really be excited about. And we thought, well, they love meeting our reindeer. What if we could introduce them to reindeer herds all over the world and um, just kind of give them a fully immersive experience in video form. And so we're very excited for that. I believe we'll have a building permit in our hand in a couple of weeks, uh, the conditional use permit probably by the end of the year. And we expect to start construction uh, right after the snow wow. melt. So around March or April of 2024. Amazing. Oh, congratulations to you guys. That, that sounds like Thank a lot you. of fun. I'm sure that we are so looking forward to it. It was so much fun choosing the music for it. We ended up getting uh, permission, speaking of Walt Disney, to use some of the music that was recorded for Frozen, but that some of it was not used. So there's a Norwegian choir called Cantus, and they're so amazing and talented, and we're going to be featuring some of their music in the presentation, um, along with some 
really neat traditional Sami music, which they're the native people of that part of the world. So um, our goal was just to highlight uh, those cultures and those people that we don't often get to hear from and um, and honor them. And I, I think it's going to be just a f fabulous journey for people to come on uh, before they go in and meet the reindeer. Very herd. neat. Well, once again, we've been joined by Erica Bowie. Erica, I think someone better call Santa Claus because you absolutely slayed it today. So thank mm. you so much. Oh, yes. I see what you did there. Thank you, <laughs> thank you we, so much. Um, I've really, really enjoyed getting to talk to you guys, and we'll definitely think about naming a baby Camelot. That would be a dream come true for me, uh, I think so. That would be we, pretty we cool. would for sure come up there and oh, you know, yeah. feed him all of the the lichen and moss, whatever he wants. We would take care of him every day. Yeah, before before I go, I feel like I would be amiss not to mention because people are listening and maybe you want to come to Leavenworth. There's so much to do here. Obviously, we'd love to see you at our farm. Um, reservations are required to come, so I just don't want to break anybody's hearts if they show up and don't have a ticket in advance. Um, we recommend booking two or three months in advance to get those tickets because they tend to sell out. And our calendar is up about a year in advance. You go to leavenworthreindeer.com or experiencereindeer.com and you can buy your tickets and view our schedule and we'd love to see you here at Leavenworth Reindeer Farm. Love to have you come meet the whole herd. Yes, thanks for bringing that up. I was going to say get your get those reservations because reservations only. So be sure to yes. get those in advance. Um well Erica, we're excited about the future of Leavenworth Reindeer Farms and um just excited for for all that uh, you're doing and appreciate all that you do for agriculture. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, you guys. It was my pleasure. With that, we'll wrap up another episode of Dirt Road Discussions and we'll see you down the road. And a Merry Christmas to and all. And a Merry Christmas. <laughs>